using equations to solve problems and algebraic expressions. So our daily summary, um, in this lesson we're going to tackle our first word problems. We're going to see a powerful technique for how to start a word problem by picking a random number to, figuring out, to figure out how to set up your expression and your equation. So now we're going to go into the demo part, which is the part where I stand at the board and show you how to do things, right? So I just want to remind you, the expectation is that you're going to work through all of the demo and all of the class activities. So I go through the demo with you, then you move on to class activities. So that might sometimes mean finishing the activities outside of class time if you, can't, if you don't have time to finish it in class. And then there's an even more practice section following the class activities. There's an even more practice. That is optional. Okay? It's there for folks who want some additional practice um, and for speed demons who finish the class activities early in class. Just so you know, that's how every lesson is set up. We've got a demo, class activities, even more practice. Okay, you're expected to finish the demo and the class activities. Okay, so getting into today's notes. Sometimes when we're asked to write an algebraic expression that describes a situation, it's hard to know where to begin. Okay, so many times you know how to do the problem if it was just all numbers, right? It's the fact that we're throwing a variable in there that makes things difficult, okay? So we're going to see how we can use numbers to find a pattern to help us create an algebraic expression. So here's a, an example from your textbook. It says, the price of a seven-day Alaskan cruise is normally $2,752 per person. But you can reduce that by $1.75 per person if you have a large group right, that travels together. How large a group will, would be needed to lower that per person price from $2,752 down to $2,500? Okay, so in this table, I've chosen two random numbers to put in the first column. I've got 10 and 50. This is the number of people traveling in the large group. If you have a group of 10 people and a num group of 50 people. And we're going to just use the numbers to figure out how much it would cost per person. So in this first row, we would say, okay, if, if 10 people are traveling together, you get 10 discounts of $1.75, right? You get $1.75 off for each person in the group. So that would means we would save 10 times $1.75, which is $17.50 per person. So you, get, you subtract that from the original cost, 2,752 minus 1750, and you get $2,734.50. So if we want to bring it down to $2,500 per person, 10 people is not enough. Right? All right, so let's try it with 50 people. Right? If we had 50 people, we'd get 50 discounts of $1.75, right? So I'm going to have to do 50 times 175, and that comes out to, I did it earlier, $87.50. Okay, so that's our discount amount, right? We are getting discounts of $1.75 for each of those 50 people, that's 87.50. So I'm going to subtract, then subtract that from the 2,752. Right, so 2,752 people it was the original price, minus 87.50, and you get 2,664 and 50 cents. So it looks like I actually, I, I need a group even bigger. It needs to be more than 50 people to bring the price down to $2,500. Okay. So let's say the number of people traveling in my large group, that's what I want to figure out, right? So I'm going to call that thing X. That's what I don't know. So I call it X. And then I'm going to try to follow the same pattern, do with the X, what you did with the 10 and what you did with the 50, right? So what I did with the numbers, the first thing I did was I multiplied the number times $1.75. 
So I'm going to multiply x times $1.75, right? And we typically would write that as 1.75x, right? And then I took that number, right, up here it was 1750, then it was 8750 for 50 people. I took that number and I subtracted from 2,752. Okay, so I'm going to take 2,752 and subtract my 175x. So that is an expression that represents the cost per person for a group of x people. You just do the same thing with the x's that you did with the numbers. Okay, and I want to know when will the cost per person be 2,500, right? So I want 2,500 there. And I have to know what x will make that equal to 2,500. So a quick detour. A quantity is anything that can be counted or measured, like length, weight, area, number, volume, time. A unit is a fundamental amount of some quantity. Inches, pounds, square meters, cars, cubic feet, hours. If you have a quantity word and a unit word and you don't know which is which, put a random number in front of each word and the word that makes sense with the number is a unit. So for example, if you have the words time and hours, does one time or one hour make sense? One hour. So that means that hours is the unit. Okay. Um, so hours is the unit and time is a quantity. All right, so if I wanted to use a quantity word and a unit word to carefully define this x, so I wrote x up here to represent the thing I didn't know. Okay. x is representing the number, that's the quantity word, of $1.75 discounts. Okay. So discounts is the unit. This is my unit, number of discounts. All right, so now I'm going to solve the problem. Okay, so now I'm going to say the cost per person is 2,752 minus 1.75x, and I want to know when that is going to equal $2,500. So I set the expression for the cost equal to 2,500, and I'm going to solve for x. And we practiced solving a bunch of equations last class. So the first thing you do would be subtract 2,752 from both sides, then divide both sides by negative 1.75, and you get 144 people, right? So you would need a group of 144 people to get the cost down to $2,500 per person. Solving real-world problems, yes? No. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's fine. So, yeah, you basically, you basically did all the work of solving the equation in your head, yeah. which is okay. It's fine. Sure yeah. Yeah, so so when things get more complicated, it's probably going to be helpful to divert to just writing out the thing that was given to you without trying to simplify in your head. But if you can, go for it. It's fine. <clears throat> okay, so solving real-world problems involves creating equations that represent the problem accurately. Okay, that's the hardest part of the word problem. And in order to solve realistic problems, we have to learn how to read the information given and translate it into an algebraic equation or equations. It takes lots of practice. This is a skill that you have to develop over time. Okay. The main thing to take away from what we did today is that if you don't know where to start, 
try picking some specific numbers and see if that gives you any insight, right? Just say, what if I do 10? What if I do 20? What if I do 30? And once you do two or three or four numbers, you might go, aha, I see a pattern. I can put an X in for the number, okay? Keep that te technique in mind while you work through the activities, um, which start on the next page. Okay, so just to review the organization of this packet, it will always start with a demo that we worked through together with me at the board, right? So that part is already done. Then there are something called activities. These are required to, to be finished, and if you don't finish them in class, you should finish them outside of class. Okay? Though I will not collect it or grade it, it's an expectation that you finish the activities. Okay, so you should get all the way up through this number five with the rectangle, all the way up through page 12, halfway through page 12. Okay. And then right after the activities, there are the answers, so you can always check your work as you're working. And then there's something called even more practice. This is entirely optional. If you finish the activities early in class, you can start these, right? Or if while you're studying, you feel you need some more practice, you got lots more practice problems available to you. The answers to those are also immediately following the problems. Answer key to even more practice. Okay, and then at the very end, it's called learning objectives after lesson number two or lesson number whatever class it is. There's a list of things that you should be able to do. And there's a reading assignment. And then there's a homework assignment. Okay. So for homework for Monday, you should finish the activities. That's a standing assignment. right? In my math lab, you're going to take one or both unit one pretests. And I gave you a handout all about my math lab. If you need help, make sure you come see me with that. Right? In my math lab, do the assignment titled Homework for Lesson Number 2. And then memorize the names of the classmates that you wrote down today. Okay. I'm not going to quiz you or anything, but they'll be super impressed if you remember their names. OK, so that's it. Um, any questions about what to do? Yes. Yes, in my math lab for Monday, you have two assignments due, one for lesson one and one for lesson two. And, and one, you just have to take one pretest. Yeah. And you should do the pretest before you do the assignment, right? The idea behind the pretest is that it will tailor your assignments to take out the things that you already know how to do. So you want to do as much of it. Yes then you will, you will have a small homework assignment. You'll still have a little bit, but it will be pretty small. Yeah. Yes, please write out your work. I'm going to come around and look at your work on Monday. So you should have a notebook with the work for the My Math Lab assignments all written out. Okay. Typically, your My Math Lab assignments will be due one class later. Um, just for these first two, I made it all due Monday. They're both due Monday just because I wanted to, you to have some time to get registered in my math lab and before, before today.